Hi, my name is Amy Peck. Welcome to the show. We are in the Detroit Institute of Arts to view the highlights of the DIA's American Art Collection. It is located in the northwest wing of the DIA's second level. The galleries contain art objects from about the 1650s to 1900. The north wing contains the rest of the American collection. The DIA has one of the best compilations of American art in the country. Furniture, paintings, decorative art, and sculpture are placed together to show the visitors how people of means decorated their rooms from the colonial period to just before World War I. Our guide through the galleries is Dr. Ken Myers, curator and department head of American art before 1950. Even the highlights of the American art collection is so vast that to show the complete tour with Dr. Ken Myers cannot be fit into a one hour program. This is the first of the two part series starting with the earliest colonial galleries to the mid 1800s. Part two of the two part series will be broadcast soon. Hello, my name's Ken Myers. I'm Curator of American Art at the Detroit Institute of Art. And it'll be my pleasure to walk with you through the DIA's great collection of American art. Indeed, the collection of American art at the DIA is one of the four or five best collections of American art before World War I any place in the country, and is well known throughout the field for the grace with which it combines painting, sculpture, decorative arts. When we laid out the gallery, we laid them out in largely chronological order. So we begin with five galleries that trace the colonial experience from about 1640 to the end of the American Revolution. Then we have five more galleries exploring themes in American art during the early national period and through the end of the Civil War. And we end with five unusually beautiful galleries dealing with themes in American art from 1870 to 1900. The rest of the great American collections are hung in the North Wing, and we won't have time to look at them today. This is our 17th century room. The earliest pieces in this room date from 1640, maybe 1650, which is very early in the colonial period, when people from Europe first began to settle permanently in the, what is now the United States. Most of the pieces in this room came from New England, Massachusetts, most of them, some of them Connecticut, the center table, the drop leaf table in the center of the room probably came from New York. If you've ever been to any colonial restorations, you know that during the colonial period, most people lived in quite small spaces. Furniture needed to be movable. Most people had very few furnishings. So the kinds of things that survived, the kinds of things we have in this room, would have been owned by the wealthiest people in the colony, people who could have lived in a large house like that that we show in the photograph on the wall. Furnishings and houses from the late 17th century, the mid-late 17th century, only survived if they were well-built and owned by the wealthiest people in the community. One of my favorite pieces in the room is this chest made in Plymouth probably around 1650. At this period in time, cabinet makers were highly trained, but not like the cabinet makers who began to come into the colonies in the 18th century. They didn't have specialized tools, they couldn't make fine dovetail joints, so that the pieces seem to us much blockier, much thicker, much heavier. There's also a different attitude towards symmetry. Pieces may be basically symmetrical, but there's a love of all sorts of symbolism and play and detail. As dark as the piece looks to us now, it probably would have been lighter at the time. And if you get up close, you can see the playfulness graining in that top or in the bottom behind those starburst patterns. Indeed, when you look at it, it's filled with different kinds of shapes. The starbursts along those two shelves on the bottom, the diagonal diamonds in the two panels to the left and right, the arches evoking Gothic windows in the center, those great turned half styles establishing columns. The style here is very unlike work we'll see in the later galleries, 
which have fewer forms arranged more carefully. Here the craftsmen clearly loved variety, loved different kinds of symbols, different kinds of images, and didn't worry about bringing different traditions together. We're now in, our, in one of our primary colonial period decorative arts galleries. In this gallery, we juxtapose furniture from the first quarter of the 18th century, about 1700 to 1725, with furniture from the second quarter of the 18th century, about 1725 to 1750. What's distinctive about this furniture and compared to what we just saw is how much lighter it is, how much narrower the legs are, how much higher it reaches into the air, how much more symmetrical it is. It seems much more elegant, less medieval, I think. There's many reasons for this change. One of the most important is that it's only in this period, after around 1700, that trained cabinet makers with the new tools and the new skills that lets them create dovetail joints and other techniques for creating more finely refined furniture begin to arrive in the colonies and begin to be able to make something like a full-time career as specialists in the manufacture of furniture. Perhaps the best way of comparing furniture of the early period, 1700 to 1725, and the slightly later period, is by looking at these two great chests. We call the chest on the left a chest on stand and a chest on chest. If you look closely, you'll see that the forms are almost identical, but the styling is oh so different. The earlier chest, the legs are turned which is a very common way of making legs for chairs and for case pieces like this in the early 18th century. You have someone named a turner who would take a block of wood, put it on a lathe, spin the lathe, and you would get turned legs like this. There was also a love of veneer. They had developed new tools for creating veneer, so we get these thin layers of maple, curly maple or walnut or other woods with interesting patterns. But the piece itself is rather square and tied down to the earth. Also, although it's hard to see, the base is not very strong the way it's laid out. So it would be difficult to move this piece side to side. What a difference 20 years can make if you look at the high chest. Made, we think, in Boston around 1740, 1760. It's elegant. It reaches much higher. If you look, most of the extra height is just for show. It's that bonnet up there, what is the only part of the piece which is higher than the top shelf on the earlier piece. Look what he does with the height. In fact, in this piece, you can really see that the piece is based on the form of the human body. Look at those legs elegantly turned out, and then the chest in the middle, and then up high, those flame finials that aspire up to the heavens. It's sort of like a head, isn't it? These pieces each would have been unavailable to most people living in the colonies in the 18th century. Only the wealthiest people would have been able to acquire truly elegant pieces of furniture like this. And in both cases, much more than in the earlier furniture we were looking at, there's an aspiration to being fully symmetrical in form. I think symmetry is really fascinating in this period because it seems to me that symmetry stands for the overcoming of nature, the use of mind to order nature to make it orderly, the ability to live in a symmetrical house, to be surrounded by symmetrical furniture is a sign that the owner has acquired self-knowledge, self-control, and is able to lead an orderly life both with the things he lives with, he and she lives with, but also in the way he and she live their lives. This is our primary gallery for American portrait paintings before Benjamin West and John Singleton Copley at the very end of the 18th century. The DIA has an unusually good collection with important portrait paintings by almost all the major colonial painters. Take these two, the one by Robert Feke on the left and by John Wollaston on the right. They're painted at almost exactly the same time as the chest we were just looking at. And I think they work much the same way. To our eyes, 
I think the care with which these sitters hold their necks, the care with which they hold their hands, seems a little stiff. But in the context of the 18th century, what that seeming artificiality suggests is that these are well-trained, educated, genteel people who know how to hold their body. And by implication, they know how to dance, they know how to speak well, they know how to present themselves. And the apparent stiffness of the posture stands for that achievement of self-discipline, which is also suggested by the symmetry of the kind of furniture they would have surrounded themselves with and the kind of houses that they would have lived in. I love these three paintings, especially the one on the far right, which is my favorite painting in the room. The painting on the right and the left are by John Smybert, the best painter active in the United States before Copley. Smybert trained in London and in Rome, immigrated to the United States in the 1730s, set up shop in Boston where he painted all the most important residents of the city. These three people were all relatives. The central figure, Mr. Bowden, was painted by Joseph Badger. Mr. Bowden was the wealthiest man in Boston, reputed to be the wealthiest man in Boston. At this time, Massachusetts still owned the land that we now think of as the state of Maine, and Bowden went on to leave the money to found the college, which is named after him. The person on the left is Bowden's daughter. The person on the right is the mother of the man that Bowden's daughter married, and I love her. What's striking to me about that sitter is that she doesn't pretend to be prettier in any conventional way than she was. That Smybert looks at her, is moved by the strength of life, of experience, of lived experience that we can see in the sort of wry look on her lips, her double chin, the bulbous nose. She knows who she is. She comes from a well-to-do family. She's not going to pretty herself up. She wants her descendants to remember her as she was. I think it might have been scary to meet her if she didn't like me, but I think th I look at her and think, God, that woman had personality. And God could Smybert capture it. The ability to capture personality, that's what made him such a great painter. This room itself is one of the great objects in the DIA's collection. It was lifted intact out of a house that was built in Philadelphia in 1754. And everything in the room is as it was when the house was made. Not the furnishings. We've added the furnishings, although almost all the furnishings were made in Philadelphia in the 1750s or 1760s. The furniture follows the same basic form we saw in the high chest from the 1740s or 1750s. But look how much more detailed it is. We reach even higher. There's even more carving. And in a move that I find especially fascinating, if you look up at that central element, what we call a cartouche, you can see that although the overall case piece is symmetrical, the cartouche plays with symmetry. It in itself is unbalanced. I think the lack of symmetry in that one element within the structure of an overall form, which is highly symmetrical, reflects a new concern with ease, with elegance. That the kind of stiffness that we saw in the portrait by Feek in the other room is giving way now to a new sense of, yes, one needs to present oneself, one needs to demonstrate one's self-control, but one should be at ease doing it. This piece is, like the other high chest we looked at, aspirational. It reaches up to the sky. It towers over the height of an individual. And yet, in its joy in carving, in its secondary gesture towards asymmetry, it indicates an easing up, a new emphasis upon the natural. I think something similar is going on in these wonderful side cabinets to the left and right of the fireplace. The one on the left has a top, a cornucopia, suggesting the spring. On the right, we have the God Ceres, suggesting the harvest. So we have two images which are alike in that they both speak to nature's bounty, but they're visually different. 
So it's symmetrical, but not completely symmetrical. It now has a new ease, a new elegance. The increasing wealth of cities like Philadelphia by the 1750s and 60s allowed the wealthiest citizens, like the people who built this house, to import silk fabrics from, from China, from Europe. The furnishings in this room are not original to the room, but they are original to Philadelphia. And we've had them reupholstered all in the same fabric as the original owner of this room probably would have done. He would have shown off to his friends that he could afford fabrics like this, that he could afford to have the whole room shown off in this way. He probably would have had curtains as well. And in fact, in his day, the most expensive things in this room would not have been the furniture, but would have been the fabric. The fabric for this sofa or this chair would have been the most expensive part of the sofa or the chair. Unlike the fabrics, by this time, by the 1750s, Americans had discovered domestic sources of marble. And the marble in this fireplace comes from outside Philadelphia in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. The overmantle, carved overmantle above the fireplace was done by one of the same carvers who would have done the kind of carvings we see on the high chest or other fancy carved Philadelphia furniture of the 1750s and 1760s. This is the last gallery in our suite of colonial galleries and shows largely paintings from the very end of the 18th century. Works by the two most important artists born in the United States. Benjamin West, born in Philadelphia, immigrated to Europe as a young man and spent the rest of his career in London. John Singleton Copley, born in Boston, enjoyed great success in Boston through the 1760s, immigrated to London, and made the rest of his career in England. West, the most important painting by West, maybe not the best, but maybe the most important painting by West in our gallery, is this great view of the Last Supper. West was a history painter specializing in the production of large, multi-figured paintings that showed off events from the biblical past, the historical past, or in something of an innovation, the historical present. Paintings like this were painted for public display and often for royal or noble patrons. In fact, this painting was painted as part of a series of paintings of New Testament scenes that originally hung in the king's private chapel at Windsor. These are the kinds of painting that made West's reputation in his own lifetime. But today, many of us prefer smaller works like this. Death on a Pale Horse looks small, but in fact, this is the oil study for a much larger painting. I forget how long it is, how large it is, but I think it's 12 or 14 feet in its finished version. The finished version would have been sketched in by West and he would have done all the most important sections of the painting, but the rest of the painting would have been worked on also by studio assistants. But this small work, what we call the oil study or the preparatory study, would have been all been painted by West. It would have been where he worked out the complexities of arranging so many figures into one canvas a skill at which he was a master. And when we get up and look at it closely, we see the inspiration of the moment, the skill with which he laid on paint. You really feel the artist's hands in these oil studies in a way that you often don't in the big versions, the final versions, like our version of The Last Supper or the completed version of Death on a Pale Horse. Unlike Benjamin West, John Singleton Copley spent the first part of his professional career in the colonies. From a very early period, he wanted to be able to paint complex, multi-figure portraits or history paintings like Benjamin West. But those kind of paintings are expensive. In Europe, you had royalty, nobility, large churches, large church organizations which could commission those kind of paintings. But no one and no organization in the United Colonies was able to order to commission those kind of works. So all of Copley's early works are portraits. 
On this wall, we juxtapose two of the portraits he painted while in Boston, the painting of Hannah Loring on the bottom left and the painting of Mrs. Benjamin Howell on the bottom right with one of the portraits he painted in the 1770s after he moved to England. What do you see that makes these paintings both similar and different? What I see is that the paintings done in Boston are stiffer, more formal. This is true in the pose of the sitter. It's also true of the way Copley added paint to the canvas, which is very careful, beautiful, but very careful. When Copley got to England, people told him that your paintings look so stiff. They look like the kind of paintings that Mr. Feek was painting 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They don't look like the kind of paintings that Mr. Reynolds is painting today, in which the sitters are show more ease and the paint is applied in bigger, more oily brush strokes. Copley looked, Copley learned, Copley decided that if he was to make his career in London, he would have to learn to paint in the more cosmopolitan style that London's sitters wanted. So he started to paint paintings like Mrs. Gayton with that apparently awkward pose with her left arm leaning on the table. What this means now, I think, is not awkwardness, but ease. This is a woman who has attained such a high degree of self-control that she can ease up to be natural. Copley moved to England both because he wanted to be able to prove himself in the art capital of Europe, but also because he wanted to have opportunities to paint the kind of complex history paintings for which Benjamin West was known. One of the most important history paintings that Copley did paint was Watson and the Shark, of which this is one of three versions. Mr. Watson, who is shown in the painting as the naked man in the bottom left, was a young merchant on a merchant trip to Havana, Cuba. While in Havana Harbor, he went for a swim, was attacked by a shark, lost his leg after being attacked by the shark, but survived and went on to become one of the wealthiest merchants in London. Once Copley arrived in London in the 1770s, Watson hired him to paint a large history painting celebrating this climactic moment in Watson's life. Here we see the rescue group reaching out to Watson, one of his friends taking a harpoon, trying to push the shark away from Watson, another man, an African-American man, throwing a rope to Watson, and two figures in white dramatically reaching out to pull him into the boat. The United States was the world's first post-colonial society. And one of the most important cultural issues facing the residents of the new nation was to decide to figure out, to popularize what it meant to be an American. Since almost everyone living in the colonies had grown up thinking of themselves as English or British or German, or as New Yorkers, or as Massachusettsites, or Pennsylvanians, or South Carolinians, or Virginians. As a whole, one of the first aesthetic languages that Americans use to explain what being American is was classicism. They looked back to the Roman Republic and saw that as a model of what a republic should be. And like their European colleagues, they began to build houses and to build furniture and to wear clothing styles which derived from Roman, usually Roman, sometimes Greek, but usually Roman evidence. Evidence which had become much more available after the discovery of Pompeii in the middle of the 18th century. So we look at pieces of furniture like this great pier table. A pier table is intended to be put between two windows with a mirror above it designed to capture and to distribute light into a room where there's candlelight at night or daylight during the day. But here, the detailing, the shape of the pier table is strongly influenced by the kind of antique Roman relics which were being discovered and publicized. We have the great dolphin feet. We have the, the winged caryatids holding up the support the use of the lyre motifs on the corners, all derive from classical antecedents, largely Roman. Even more extravagant in some ways is the wine chest. 
We call it a cellaret, which would have held six large bottles of wine. And if it was white wine, would have held ice also. But when you look at what's holding them up, what we see are lady sphinxes, which combine classical elements with Egyptian motifs. You can see the classical motifs on this great New York style sofa from around 1810, which like the pier table uses dolphin, winged dolphins for the feet. And above them, this incredibly elegant Philadelphia couple painted by Thomas Sully. On the left, Dr. Edward Hudson, and on the right, his young wife. Look at her clothes, for example. That low-cut bodice, the high cinched waist, the ribbon around her forehead, all derived from classical dress and communicate in her clothes both that this is a young lady of fashion, but that the fashion she chooses to wear identifies her as the citizen of a republic, of refined taste, but also of republican responsibilities. All four paintings on this wall were painted by members of the Peel family, the most important group of painters active in Philadelphia from the 1760s until the early 1800s. The founder of the family was Charles Wilson Peel, and here we have two late paintings by Charles Wilson Peel. On the right, a painting of his rural estate in what was then the outskirts of Philadelphia called Belfield, and then a wonderful painting from 1822 of his brother, James Peel. And on the far left of the wall, we have two paintings by Charles Wilson Peel's son, Rembrandt Peel. Both self-portraits, and strikingly not painted all that many years apart, only painted 18 years apart, but we can see him move from the youthful vigor of the self-portrait on the left to the more middle-aged vigor of, of the sitter in the center. But the greatest painting on the wall, one of the greatest paintings at the DIA, is this fabulous late portrait by Charles Wilson Peel of his brother James. We see James looking at a portrait miniature with a miniature painter's brush and easel on the table in front of him, his face quite literally illuminated by light coming through the oil lamp at the left of the painting. This is, I think, quite literally and quite self-consciously a painting about enlightenment, in which Charles Wilson Peale celebrates his brother as an ideal Republican citizen. The person who in his youth and middle age, indeed throughout his entire life, served his country in public service, in his profession, and in his role as a father. We know from an earlier preparatory drawing for this painting that the oil shade, the shade was originally to be inscribed with scenes of battles in which James Peel served as an officer during the American Revolution. Charles Wilson Peel apparently decided that that was too fussy, but in the remaining painting, he made the same point by having his brother wear his badge, showing that he was a member of the Society of the Cincinnati, a public group limited to men who had served as officers during the American Revolution. So the badge suggests that James Peel served his country in its time of greatest need as a warrior, as a public official, as an officer. But the painting also suggests that Peel served his country in his profession as a painter, as suggested by the paintbrush in the front left. And not only did he serve his country as a painter, he served his country as a Republican parent, someone who raised his children to have a career of their own, suggested by the fact of the miniature, which is a painting by his daughter of his niece. Americans in this period were learning to think of themselves as citizens of a republic with the responsibilities of citizenship. And here, Charles Wilson Peale paints his brother, his beloved brother, as an ideal citizen who served his country in both war and peace, as an officer, as an artist, and as a father. Attitudes towards nature changed dramatically between the 18th century and the middle of the 19th. As Americans learned to think of the natural world and human nature, not as something evil and corrupt, but as something pure and untrammeled. 
We see this change in paintings of children and in paintings of the natural world. 18th century portraits of children often look rather stiff to us as the children are shown dressed in clothes that we think of as adult clothes, standing with stiff posture, heads erect, hands held, often in quite formal poses. The children in these paintings seem very formal. At the time, 18th century, maybe even early 19th century, I think these paintings communicated the fact that these were good children. They had learned self-control. And the parents and the painters wanted to represent the children as having internalized the self-discipline, which parents, the entire society, thought was one of the most important skills for any young person to learn. Self-discipline was important because at this time, people still assumed that children were, by nature, little rebels. They needed discipline. They needed to be disciplined from without until they had internalized self-discipline. So in these paintings, like this small portrait of Amarinthia Eliot, she is shown as, she's probably only six or eight in this painting, but she already knows how to wear her clothes. She knows how to hold her stuff. If she's asked to be quiet through dinner, she will be quiet through dinner. Who knows what she was like in real life? But if a parent was going to the expense of having their child immortalized in paint and oil on canvas, they wanted her represented as the best child she could be. And this kind of pose stood in the 18th century for the achievement of self-discipline, which was the necessary characteristic of any mature adult. What a world of difference there is between those 18th century paintings and these paintings from the mid 19th century, in which the boys, and they are both boys, are shown in less formal clothes, striking less formal poses. Here, the artist Chester Harding has shown his son with his dog, nothing on his feet, bare knee, the dog filling much of the picture frame. What this painting suggests, it seems to me, is that this is a natural boy, where nature here doesn't stand for the fallen world and corruption, but nature rather has come to stand for this painter and his parts of contemporary American culture as a source of value and goodness. This child was not born in sin, as the father might have thought a hundred years before. Rather, this boy was born, as Wordsworth would say, trailing clouds of glory and is to be celebrated in all his youthful vigor and rambunctiousness and lack of discipline. The earliest American landscapes came from the late 18th century, the 1770s, more the 1790s, but you don't get a well-developed domestic tradition of landscape painting until the 1820s. Changing attitudes towards nature can also be seen in the representations of the natural world. Instead, what you get are landscape backgrounds to history paintings or allegorical paintings or portraits. The earliest straight landscape paintings painted in the United States date from the 1780s or the 1790s and were bought by a limited number of the most cosmopolitan Americans, men like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or the wealthiest New York or Boston merchants. Landscape begins to become more popular in the 1720s. At the DIA, one of our great treasures is this wonderful landscape by Francis Guy. Not very well known today, Guy lived in Brooklyn, New York. In 1817, he followed the main line of commerce up the Hudson River to Lake George, then up Lake George to Lake Champlain, out Lake Champlain to uh, the St. Lawrence River in Montreal and Quebec. This became the great line of tourism after 1825 or so, but Guy got there right after the end of the War of 1812 and came back to New York with a set of four paintings showing this great line of tourism. We know that he painted four paintings because he publicized them in an ad he took in a local paper. But this is the only one to survive, and it is, to my mind, the greatest landscape painting painted in the United States before 1825. It's large in size, dramatically shows the mountains on the east side of Lake Champlain, but it also 
quite truthfully shows the structure of the beginning of a native tradition of tourism. The Carter's Tavern at the far right was an important stopover for merchants and other travelers who were making their way from Canada to the United States. People who would have been there may have been tourists out to spend money looking at landscape, but that expenditure, that pursuit of environmental experience was just beginning in 1817 and 1818, and Carter's Tavern still would have been largely dependent upon businessmen traveling to arrange for the purchase of wood products or farm goods or for the sale of finished materials. We've now moved into works from the 1840s and 1850s, reflecting a very different moment in American political, cultural, and aesthetic history. When we were in the Classicism Gallery, it came at a moment of time when Americans were explaining to themselves that what made them American was that they were citizens of a republic. There was not a king, but the people were king. But society was understood to be hierarchically organized so that the wealthier and better educated people had responsibilities to lead and to control their social inferiors who were less able, less skilled to exert positions of leadership within society. Or at least that's what the theory was. By the 1840s, Andrew Jackson had been president the country was becoming much more individualistic. Many Americans were becoming increasingly unwilling to defer to people who thought of themselves as leaders of society. And just at this moment, as Americans begin to think of themselves as citizens not of a republic, but of a democracy, American painters begin to find a ready market for scenes of everyday life of typical or common Americans. And this room is filled with those kind of images. Farm workers at play, or a young boy going to school for the first time, or four travelers in a railroad or stagecoach waiting room. The card players is one of the best known scenes of everyday life what we call genre paintings at the DIA. It shows four people in a waiting room someplace near Baltimore where the artist Richard Caton Woodville came from. The focus of the painting is on the man at the center pointing to one of his cards. He seems a little befuddled. He's certainly the oldest person in the picture. And the painting suggests that one reason he may be befuddled is that the glass in front of him which has a little bit of an amber colored liquor at the bottom is almost empty. Whereas the person he's playing cards with, his glass is still almost completely full. The person on the center with the big long pipe slung over his left shoulder is a recent German immigrant. And the person the older man is playing cards with is dressed as a young street guy, a young guy from the hood somebody who knows his way around the world. And if you look closely and get up close, you can see that underneath his left thigh is an extra ace, suggesting that he knows how to win. Off in the distance, behind the fireplace, is an African-American man holding a carpet bag, probably a servant, free or slave. It could be either of the older man. Does he know that his boss or his owner is being cheated? We wonder. But whether he knows it or suspects it, he's in a position where he is not allowed to say anything. Because whether free or enslaved, he's disempowered, pushed off to the corner, not able to take his place at the center of this dramatic story. While the vast majority of American genre paintings produced in the 1840s and early 50s are of men doing something vigorous and manly in the world. A few focused on women and almost always showed women either as mothers or as wives. Most often as mothers and most often in the home, as is true of all three of these paintings on our wall. Or I should make somewhat of an exception, the painting on the left, burnt out, shows a woman in the process of being burnt out from her home 
Her face is illuminated with an unearthly glow. We don't exactly know where it comes from, but if we saw the painting when it was new in 1849, we would know that that funny wood shape at the left corner of the canvas is a fire hydrant and that the glow is coming from this woman's home burning down and that all she's managed to rescue are her mattress, a traveler's trunk, a broken candle, a broken mirror, a Bible, and most important of all, her two children. She looks off to her left, watching her home burn, but with a look and a pose based on paintings of fortitude, a Roman virtue, and we know this woman is a heroic mother who will not let her children down. Along similar lines, we have the great portrait by Lily Martin Spencer showing a young married couple with their two infants in bed Another painting which celebrates the new romantic attitude towards nature. These children are so wonderful in themselves, so naturally perfect, that they don't need to wear diapers because they wouldn't soil those clean sheets. The parents look down in love at these children and celebrate the joys of domesticity. The portraits of women are celebratory. They celebrate women as wives and as mothers. But if you think about it, women in these paintings are being pigeonholed. It suggests that their proper place is in the home as mothers or as wives, that they shouldn't look to have careers outside of the home. Something similar is going on in these paintings of Native Americans. On the one hand, the Native Americans are celebrated as noble figures. Their pose is based on Roman statuary. Like the woman in Burnt Out, these are heroic figures. But like the woman in Burnt Out, they're also shown as being limited. Noble, yes, but noble savages. The Indian Telegraph, the painting on the left, implies or makes explicit in its very title that the Indian Telegraph may seem heroic, but it's doomed to destruction because the real telegraph, the electronic telegraph, is going to sweep its way in the progress of history. Something similar is implied, I think, by the great Bierstadt painting of Wolf River, where we see an early moment in the history of interaction between Western fur trappers and native suppliers. Here, the men cross the river. It's Edenic. It's peaceful. But we know that the fur trappers are the first wave of an encroaching civilization, and that as farmers and cattlemen follow in their path, the Indians will not be able to continue to pursue their traditional way of life on the prairie. The painting, too, implies without quite stating that as noble as Native Americans seem, their way of life is doomed by the progress of Western American civilization. All the paintings in this gallery were done by African American artists. One reason, one important reason why we wanted to bring works by African American artists together into a single gallery is that they worked in standard styles like that of Anglo-American painters working in the same decades. So that if we hung these paintings in the regular galleries, one might not even notice that they were made by African American artists. Everything on this wall was painted by an artist named Robert Scott Duncanson, who spent much of his career in Cincinnati and a good part of his career here in Detroit. One of his best known paintings, Uncle Tom and Little Eva, was commissioned by a Detroit resident and shows a climactic scene from Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, where the Edenic child, Little Eva, is talking with Tom about their shared faith in Christ and redemption. Duncanson often had to struggle to make a good living and painted works in a wide variety of different genres, including still lifes and portraits and religious paintings. But most of his most important paintings are landscapes, of which this is one of the greatest, showing Ellen's Isle, Loch Trek Catrine in Scotland. Like a painting by Thomas Cole, which probably lies behind this work, or Worthington Whitridge, who Duncanson knew when they were both living in Cincinnati. The painting is organized into clear foreground, middle-bound background with a tree marking the right closure, 
a diagonally organized view down the center pulling the eye from the foreground back to the setting sun in the background. Genre painting dominated discussion of American art through the 1840s and into the early 1850s. But by the mid-1850s, landscape had come to the center of artistic production. The first important American landscape painter was Thomas Cole. Cole, born in England, immigrated to the United States as a child, moved to New York in 1825 where he began to produce unprecedented scenes of American wilderness, like the DIA's great painting of Catterskill Falls. His early reputation was founded on these scenes of wilderness, but within a few years, he began to paint paintings like the one in the center of the wall of Europe, often with ruins. And this contrast between Europe, identified by ruins or old buildings with the past, and wild nature, which symbolized the opportunity, the openness, the newness of the new world. Catterskill Falls, was painted in 1826 when Cole was a very young man at the very beginning of his career. Almost 20 years later, he painted this view of a lake in New Hampshire, probably based on Lake Winnipesaukee, but Cole gave it a generic title, calling it American Lake Scene. It's a calm sunset, the figure, hard to see, seated on that little rocky outcropping, is a Native American docked his canoe watches the sunset lost in reverie at God's beneficence that shines on the world. In addition to these paintings, the DIA also has a wonderful collection of about 3,500 drawings by Thomas Cole, about 80% of the drawings he ever produced. They're one of the real treasures of the museum. We acquired them back in 1939 when there wasn't much interest in Hudson River drawings. We bought them directly from Cole's descendants. And we're so proud of them that we often have a small sampling of five or six of them on view in the galleries. One of the things that's wonderful about our collection of Cole drawings is that it lets us see Cole at work. The drawing we're looking at now was done on a trip to New Hampshire and is typical of the works that he did in the spring, summer, and fall when he was working outdoors visiting motifs that he would paint in his studio in the fall and winter. Here, when you get up close to it, you can see that he's not just outlining Mount Coraway in New Hampshire, but he's leaving himself color notations to say rocky stone, gray, or sky blue, or trees deep green. The drawing in the middle is very different. It was a drawing that he did in the studio when he was planning out the design of one of his imaginary paintings, a painting based on the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, as described by Milton in his great poem, Paradise Lost. One of the reasons that artists like Cole drew outside rather than painting was that if they wanted to paint outside, they had to prepare, mix their colors with oil, store them in pig bladders which they tied off with rope and take the prepared paints with them into the woods. But the paints dried out, the ties came off, and worst of all, the pig bladders were easily punctured. So both creating a mess and wasting often expensive colors. American painters didn't start to paint outside until the 1840s after the invention of prepared oil paints in lead tubes. One of the first of the artists to work out side that way was Thomas Cole and we're lucky enough to have one of very few outdoor plein air paintings that Thomas Cole painted, this little view of a rivulet in deep woods. Cole died about two years after this painting was, this oil study was done and oil studies never became central to his practice the way they did for other artists like Albert Bierstadt in the 1850s and 1860s. This wonderful painting of Vernal Falls in what is now Yosemite National Park was painted by Bierstadt on his first visit to the falls, painted on paper, a lightweight support, but then he had the paper mounted on canvas after he got back to New York. Drawings like this were sometimes sold, but were most often kept by the artist as aids to memory in the studio, and he would use them to create larger paintings, which he sold. In the mid-1840s, the two American landscape painters who seized 
on the availability of oil paints most aggressively were Asher B. Durand, we see his Monument Mountain on my left, and then further on my left, John Frederick Kensett. Beginning about 1845, Kensett and Durand spent months every summer and fall working outdoors, working on small 18 by 22 oil studies that they would work on for days or even weeks at a time, focusing on the details of forest interiors, of mossy rocks, of moss-grown trees. Then, back in the studio in the winter and spring, they would turn their oil studies into large finished paintings like these. Monument Mountain is based on, takes its title from a poem by William Cullen Bryant. We see the mountain in the background filled with this rushing water of a Berkshire stream and a clear passageway on the right indicating a trail. No people have pressed into this wilderness. Duran values it as an untrammeled nature, beautiful in itself. Kensett and Durand were influenced by Cole, knew Cole well, often worked with him. In fact, Durand, who was a little older than Cole, was one of Cole's closest friends until Cole's death. Unlike Durand and Kensett, Frederick Church, whose painting code epoxy we're looking at now, was a full generation younger than Cole. Not so much a friend as a student. Born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut, Church decided as a young man that he wanted to become a landscape painter, and his well-to-do father arranged for Church to study with Cole in Cole's home in Catskill, New York from 1844 to 1846. By the early 1860s, when this painting was painted, Church was the most successful, best paid, most famous artist active in the United States. In the 1850s, in search of new wild scenery, he went to South America, to the Andes, to see the great volcanoes, including this painting in Ecuador, what was then Ecuador, known as Cotopaxi, which he thought was the highest peak in the Andes, and which he also believed to be the most perfectly shaped volcano in the world. Church painted Cotopaxi on a number of occasions, this being the climactic painting of the series. In this painting, Church is eager to explore the cycles of nature, the cycles of geology, of new material coming up from the interior of the earth as ash, and then water eroding the cliffs and forming the rocks that fill the chasm. Like other contemporaries, Church was an eager reader of the discoveries of geological science that in the late 18th and early 19th century had taught many Americans that the world was not 6,000 years old, but billions of years old, and that in looking at a wild scene like these Andean mountains, that one saw the slow work of millions and billions of years of geological change. In the context of this time, an individual life didn't seem to matter much, and Church seems to indicate that by giving us one small human figure, an Andean boy with his llama, that marks both the presence of the native peoples, but also the relative unimportance in the scale of history of an individual human life. But while Church was open to the fruits of geological science, he was also a believing Christian who felt that although life, individual human life might not seem to mean much, the vicissitudes of time and history were still informed by the presence of God. And if you look at that blood red sun in the distance on the right and follow its reflections on that lake, you see that the reflection goes both to the left and the right and forward from the background to the foreground, creating a cross, seeming to suggest that although life may not seem to mean much given the millions of years and billions of years of geological time, Nonetheless, the artist wants us to recognize his faith that a divine purpose informs both human history and geological time.
This was part one of the two-part series of touring the DIA's American galleries with curator Dr. Ken Myers. Part two will show the Hudson River landscape galleries, historical paintings, the aesthetic movement of the 1870s to 1900, some famous portraits with famous artists, and a brief visit to the North Wing galleries to showcase paintings by James McNeil Whistler. A visit to the Detroit Institute of Arts is a wonderful experience. The American art galleries show how Americans appreciated art through the centuries and how they changed from colonists in the New World to artists and citizens of this New World. The DIA is open Tuesdays through Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Fridays, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more information, call 313-833-7900 or visit www.dia.org. Admission to the museum is free for Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County residents. Come and visit one of America's great museums.